back to the Con Guy podcast here on that hashtag show YouTube channel. Today we are talking about the brand new film Skylines. When a virus threatens to turn earth dwelling friendly alien hybrids against humans, Captain Rose Corley, played by Lindsay Morgan, must lead a team of elite soldiers on a mission to the alien's world in order to save what is left of humanity. Skylines, which arrives in select theaters and on demand December 18th, is the third installment of the Skyline franchise and stars stars Lindsay Morgan. She was from The 100 and Inside Game. Jonathan Howard from Thor, Dark World, Godzilla, King of Monsters, and many more. Rona Mitra, Alexander Sedic, and James Castle. Today, we are talking with Jonathan Howard, who plays Leon, an elite soldier, and the film's writer-director, Liam O'Donnell. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. So glad to see you. Also thank joining you for us. Yeah, today on today's podcast are my partners in crime. Who we got? Luke. Hey, over here. I am Cheeseman. I'm a filmmaker and screenwriter, and most importantly, here with theconguy.com. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's me, old buddy Ben Cleaver. Uh, glad to be here. And again, we're coming to you from that hashtag shows network, as always, brought to you by Neft Vodka, reminding you to please drink responsibly. <clears throat> Yep. Oh, I didn't know we had a vodka sponsor. Yeah, a vodka sponsor. If you we guys have coffee have too, right? That's a coffee over. sponsor. <laughs> it's yeah, I'm not sure guys. if we're still doing the Bla- the Death Wish okay. coffee or not, but for a while there, they, they might still be doing it. Death Wish coffee, fair trade, uh, highly caffeinated, the world's strongest coffee. If you use the, <laughs> I love doing advertisements. Uh, use the code hashtag show at deathwishcoffee.com. You can get 10% off your order. And I actually drink Death Wish coffee. I was drinking it before we got it as a sponsor. It's insane. I love the stuff. My wife and I drink it by the gallon. <laughs> there you go. Try. So, and Matt, and Jonathan, can cool. you guys tell us where you are coming to us from today since we're all in different locations? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm from Los Angeles, actually. For my sins, I am stuck in my house in Los Angeles. But it's great to talk to you guys because it means my wife is taking my daughter out. I actually have some time to myself, so thank you for <laughs> allowing this break from family life. Yeah. Well, I, I'm in uh, Los Angeles as well, and uh, all four kids in the house and a dog. So if you hear stuff in the background, that's, that's just the, the insane asylum. That's Great. how it goes. All three of us are in Los Angeles today. We're separated by the pandemic. So I'm going to be together <laughs> chatting today. So close, yet so far. <laughs> But anyways, let's let's go ahead and jump into the film, the name of the film, Skylines. Liam, if you could, for people who may not be as familiar with Skyline franchise, give us a little synopsis of what this particular film is about and maybe a little bit of history where it came from. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the first movie was very much, um, you know, a bunch of people kind of waking up to discover that uh, the apocalypse has happened and then getting uh, mass abducted onto uh, a spacecraft in part two. We kind of started concurrently, um, a little bit lost, sort of in inspired storytelling, uh, and then went uh, obviously beyond it. And we set up that the offspring of the couple from the first movie has, uh, you know, she's her exposure to this alien light when she was in utero has given her these uh, fantastical abilities. Uh, but also, you know, she's got a bunch of... I guess, uh, issues and the fact that she's growing really fast and she's, uh, facing death. Um, and so part three is jumping off of the wraparounds of part two, uh, which is setting up that character as now a grown up in sort of this heroic sort of, uh, John Connor meets Sarah Connor type of character, uh, trying, trying to save the world and, and fight back against the aliens. And, uh, in part three, we, we kind of even go farther beyond that five years afterwards to set up this whole new adventure. Um, which you guys uh, described in, in the, the mouthful of a log line. Uh, but it's really, uh, you know, kind of a uh, a, a mash of, of doing a, a sort of post-apocalyptic story where we, we're dealing with the fallout of an alien invasion much farther down the line than you normally get to see. Uh, and then mixing that into a, a kind of a cool uh, new take on uh, with a space adventure and introducing new aliens and characters and, and kind of, Letting, letting me play with all the toys in the toy chest. Yeah. Super Sounds cool. like a blast. <laughs> and I got, I got a question, and then I'm going <clears> to <throat> pitch it over to Ben and Luke. But, like, Jonathan, 
And just to give folks a little bit of an introduction, it seems like you kind of have been making a name for yourself as an action hero, basically. Your recent work includes the films World War Z with Brad Pitt, Thor The Dark World with Chris, Chris Hemsworth, and Godzilla King of Monsters. In addition to just a couple TV series that I'll mention, The Last Ship and Kingdom. Um, wow, what is it that what is it about these action roles that attracts you and, and, and your most recent role here as well? Um, unemployment, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so the only guys that give me a job. No, uh, um, you know, I don't know. Like I think for in, in what I do in Skylines is definitely more physical. This is a completely different kind of guy that, you know, what they do for is Ian the intern who's kind of this comical light relief geeky, uh, you know, scientist, whereas uh, with Leon, you know, he's definitely got a bit more depth to him. He's definitely got this, this backstory. And, you know, what attracted me to Leon was, um, you know, that this guy, he's not aware of this at the start of the movie, but he's, he's lost and he's sad and he, he doesn't know this. And he doesn't know how to express this. And he thinks he's found this tribe with the likes of Alexander Siddig and Daniel Bernhardt. And he's like, I'm going to follow these guys. And, and what I loved about Leon and, and what Liam wrote with this film is, is, is Leon's arc, you know, from where he's, is at the beginning of the movie to where he is at the end of the movie. Um, I thought it was something that I don't see a lot in sci-fi movies, where it is character-driven. And, you know, and I like to think I brought some, oh yeah, there we are, there's me looking for the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but, you know, I'd say like, I do have a martial arts background, and I did go to a uh, drama school in, in the UK called Lambda, and stage combat was a big part of it. And, um, this is, even though you mentioned Kingdom, which is a show about you know MMA fighters, uh, I actually just play Nick Jonas's gay assistant boyfriend. Um, but I'm like, finally, I get to show some skills, and he's like, no, you just you're just the assistant in this. Um, <laughs> So when, when, Liam, when Liam offered me this, you know, it, it was a really good opportunity for me to, to show that I can be physical and that I, I can attempt to, to be the leading man for a change. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of, kind of why I jumped on this one. Cool. The classic actor right. answer, I like having work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the honest answer. I mean, I can tell you that it's like, you know, character and storyline, but, you know. And also, actually, I have to add, at the time, my, my wife, uh, uh, Elodie Young, who's an actor, um, she was doing a movie in Toronto, and I told her that I wasn't going to work, and that I was going to take care of our daughter and be a supportive partner. And then, and then, <laughs> script and I was like ah, I could also go to Lithuania for three months and have like eight hours of pure sleep um, I'm going to go and do this space movie I'll be back in three months <laughs> hmm. yeah. Hmm. yeah it's a thinker <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny save humanity uh, take care of my baby you know. right it's a noble thing right you know I went to save it's true humanity. Hey, you have to provide. That's part of being uh, a parent. You got yeah, to go. point. Table. Luke, I think I stepped on you uh, in that last question. Um, oh, no. I was just saying you were almost a Jonas brother. Joe Bros. Joe Bros. But Joe yeah, go for Ben. Ben? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this, this movie looks amazing. The um, you know, And this was done primarily on an independent level, wasn't it, Liam? And it's very special effects heavy. And I've done independent uh, projects that are very special effects heavy, but there's a lot of development, a lot of time that goes into it. Was this the the, the success or the recognition of the first two Skyline films that kind of rolled into this one to make it so epic and, and et cetera? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a benefit to, to doing a sequel is that you're building off a foundation, right? Um, the first movie was, uh, was, was a lot of R and D. Um, and that was at hydraulics. And the second one was at hydraulics as well. Um, visual effects company, this third one, the only way to get it made was to make it a UK co-production. So we had to find a, uh, a UK visual effects partner, which we did in, uh, lip sync. Uh, and so they, that was kind of a, a different experience for me because I had to kind of like, take everyone to like skyline school uh which is really like nerdy uh you know it's stuff that's not really even in the movie but you have to use the language 
uh, when you're doing all the visual effects of, of like what each creature is and what they can do and how the tentacles look and, and how the light, uh, the, the volumetric light of uh, the siren lights work and behave. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was, it, it was, it was definitely like more, uh, it required more flexibility and more communication on my end, especially because we had such a short um, post time, you know, we locked the, the edit in February of this year. Oh, wow. Visual effects didn't really start into March. And I'm going to be honest with you, they didn't, they, even that March into July was like, or maybe into June was like a lot of just working on the space look and developing um, the opening and the ending and the, the planet, uh, the cobalt um, destruction stuff without giving too much away. Um, and so it really all poured in like July, August, September, and even obviously October to the very, very last day. Um, oh, wow. They did an amazing job um, on on such a you know like small like you said small resources short schedule. Um, there's a lot of really great filmmaking tools. If you guys are saying your filmmakers like um, Frame.io is an amazing uh, cloud based uh, piece of I think I guess it would be software where we could put every single visual effect shot up um, and you can make notes per frame and it lets you just draw on everything. And everyone that I wanted to have access to it, I could tag them for different notes. And it helped when you're, you know, we're using Lip Sync as the main vendor, but we also had a bunch of smaller vendors, um, you know, from the US and from India and from Germany. So uh, it helped everybody get on the same page and they could all see that, you know, the same movie that we're making. Um, any 24 hours a day, because obviously you're all, everyone's working on different schedules. Mm -hmm. Now, being a convention That's type show, um, we love creatures. We love, you know, like the big monsters and all that. Can you tell us a little bit about that design, how you came up with it, and just the what you're trying to create with all these monsters? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the one that the, the main one that we inherited from the first movie is the tanker, which um, I think my favorite scene is when uh, Leon and uh, and Lindsay, you know, kind of fight together and end up getting inside one of these monsters, which is like feels like it's sort of the um, the culmination of of the three movies to me in, in a funny way. Uh, and I just love I love how how kind of uh, uh, how fun the tone gets uh, in the back half of this film. But that tanker, uh, that that's when we inherited the the pilots, which uh, the character of Trent. And, uh, and Violet and some of the other characters in, in the Harvesters were ones that developed in part two to be, um, you know, physical foam latex suits, you know, basically throwing it back to the original Predator and Alien films, like the exact same technology updated. Um, and, and so then for part three, uh, I wanted to ha obviously have some new creatures. Um, one, we have sort of a Russian doll motif where there's always like a, a creature inside a creature. And yeah. so for the... Um, our, our matriarch character, I wanted to kind of like peel back the harvester's face and see what was underneath it. And so um, that was developing a CG look um, through scope out of Cologne and, and lip sync and, and kind of bringing that to life. And I'm really happy. We had Fong uh, Zhang, who is a, a great uh, stunt performer who works with Real Deal Effects. And he kind of performed that character, which ended up being the real basis for, for what that creature did. And then, of course, we have our, our new creatures in this. That uh, that Jonathan has a cool fight uh, fight scenes with our the shadows, and so the the motivation for them to me was like I have these big guys in these practical suits as aliens, and we're going to have those on Earth during those action scenes, and those are very kind of big and clunky, and so I wanted the the creatures on the alien planet to be a lot faster and uh, move more nimbly and, and kind of feel a little bit more dangerous, like they could just come up behind you and, and pull you into the darkness, and so those were all done with uh, practical stuntmen on set in um, tracking marker leotards. Like it's not mocap, it's very much just having someone in a leotard with tracking markers and basing the final animation off of their in-camera performance. It's just like, it's like an old technology that, you know, still 100% works and allows you to kind of bake in really great performance if you have great stuntmen, which we did. And, and it helped, I would think Jonathan, uh, you know, speaking of a guy who like, you know, the, the big difference, I'd say, uh, I think he backed me up between like a Godzilla and in uh, those movies is the prep time. You know, they have so much money to get the actors in 
to prepare on these action scenes. And for us, it's like, hey, dude, you're filming in two weeks. Like, here's some creatine and like a sword. And like, he, luckily, he had this amazing background uh, because you know his fight scene where he runs up and tries to rescue Rose in the cavern. I think he'd rehearsed it like a few times, and it's like, okay, it's go time. Techno Crane's going. You've got to hit all these beats. And by the way, you're ten feet off the ground, and you could fall off. Uh, so he, he went up and, and and he kind of nailed that. That was that was when I was like, okay, we're we're, we're like super lucking out on this guy. And then I kind of pushed it further on on his next big action scene. I was like, you know, we have we haven't really done a oneer yet. Do you think you could do you know a oneer when you fight these aliens, you know, with a sword? And so he he embraced that. And I think he like worked at the stunt guy's apartment like really late two nights in a row, and then bang, we're on set, we're doing it. <laughs> cool. Jeez, Louise, Jonathan, ex expand on that a little bit. Like from the you know from the actor's perspective i've done stunts and stuff too indie you don't have a whole lot of time how satisfied were you with the final product yeah you know we touched upon uh you know difference on you know these big budget movies like your marvel films and your godzilla films and as fun as they are to be on you know the advantage of doing uh, a film like skylines is that it's an indie sci-fi movie so yeah the budget is one tenth of what uh, you know thor was but what is the payoff for that? Well, the payoff is that you don't have a hierarchy of 20 exec producers right. that are going to like, you know, are going to be arguing over a syllable or, you know, a word in a sentence. And um, this was me and Liam, and Matthew, a Chalstead producer. And, and we'd have these little conversations during the scene of like, what about if we just try and reveal this about Liam? What about if we just change this? And he's like, Liam, you know, why well, I love working with Liam. And that's why I have such a great experience on this is, um, there became a level of trust pretty early on in this process um, where he trusted me and, uh, and I could try and go, you know, make some bolder choices than maybe I, I have done in, in these other, you know, bigger budget movies. Um, mm -hmm. And it just meant that there was a freedom. And uh, yeah, sometimes those choices fell flat on his face and was like, <laughs> what did you just try then? <laughs> but, you know, uh, but then sometimes it, was, it would work and we would keep it. Um, and then, yeah, absolutely, the, the only negative about it is the action side of it. Um, you know, luckily I have, like, some experience in, in, in martial arts, but by no means am I Jackie Chan. <laughs> and, so, uh, and, you know, and so, uh, yeah, it was real. It was rock and roll, sci-fi, indie filmmaking at times. Um, but I love that. And it's like, okay, what are you going to do? It's fight or flight. I'm either going to jump into this with my instincts and just say, pedal to the metal, let's have a go. Um, and, and that's what we did. And, uh, you know, I'm actually very proud of the fight scenes, especially because, you know, more than half of those fight scenes, we choreographed on the day, in the morning, as yeah, Liam yeah. said, like the night before in the stunt guy's uh, apartment, like using <laughs> using a toilet roll as a, as a, you know, as one of these hybrid swords. <laughs> what are we doing here? Like, I have no idea. But, you know, that trust with Liam that, all right, <laughs> I just focus on my stuff and I'm going to let Liam worry about everything else. Right. That's filmmaking. As far as I'm concerned. That's <laughs> well, I have a question. So um, this film, if you break it down is basically, or it's, it's an alien pandemic. It's about, you know, an, an alien pandemic. I guess you could describe it that way. Um, would you describe it that way? And if so, do you think it's kind of like a, it resonates a little bit more because of when it's, really I, I don't know I I, I uh, think it could be a double edged sword I, I try to like you know I want people to know it's a good time first and foremost and not like a depressing <laughs> yeah. reminder of our current situation yeah. so I'm always like yeah it's funny that that, that that those things turned out but at the same time like uh you know, uh, I, I really wish that we could just go on a space mission right now and, and get our lives back to normal and get everybody <laughs> back to safety. Um, but yeah, it, it is it is weird. Like I even remember, you know, like doing the scene with Lindsay and, and Alexander at the beginning where they're talking about the pandemic and, and kind of setting up the stakes of the movie. And uh, even some I think someone was like, what what exactly is the pandemic? Like it wasn't really like. Uh, you know, in our vernacular, the way it is now. Um, but yeah, it's 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 both both a good and a bad thing. We're 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 relevant, but I wish we weren't. Hey, can I just rephrase that though? It's not really a pandemic film. It's you know that that's a little bit of the basis. It's it's more a film like Alien, Starship Troopers, yeah. these, these big action films which we all grew up on, which we love. Now, um, can you talk 
it's more like that. And is are these films that were they um, inspirations for you when you were making this film? Oh, obviously, yeah. I mean, I you I, I wear I can't help but wear my inspirations on my sleeve. Um, mm-hmm. But I do feel like it's like a there's like a certain type of movie that was made in the '80s and '90s that like they stopped kind of making um, at least at this budget level which even to say we're like a tenth of those big budget movies but like they just stopped making them which it is that um you know that james cameron paul verhoven uh john mcturnan J- uh, john carpenter kind of vibe that um obviously is like it's my favorite type of movie it's the type of movie i still every friday night if that if there was a new movie like that every friday night that's the one i would click on every single time and i i just feel like uh, i think like a lot of people in our generation it's just like but they they want to go back to that they want new versions of those stories and uh you know hopefully that's kind of what we're doing um because you know that that's still the stuff that most inspires me i, I do love a lot of new movies I, I'm, I'm definitely not one of those people that like uh oh i hate this like i i really love the marvel movies i i like Thor Dark World. I like yeah. uh, Mandalorian. <laughs> I like all, I, I really do enjoy it, but there is something to be said about that kind of like physical based action sci-fi with some hard edges to it, R-rated stuff that like it just seems to have gone away. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we're we're keeping that spirit alive. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the that's the biggest issue in Hollywood today is that original sci-fi ip is very hard to shop around to a major uh uh, budget you know studio or or contributor uh because they just see it as a big risk a big expensive risk and so that's i think independent is where a lot of that but even us i mean there's a reason why it's part three right like it's like i I, there to, to if we wanted to get this movie done as an original story and we took the name skylines out it would have been impossible Right. Impossible to get this right. movie at this budget level, you know, it, it just wouldn't it wouldn't happen. So, to me, I kind of take it on as a, a responsibility to science fiction community, and that that I'm a fan of and uh, a lover of. That like it, each one has to feel like its own thing, and and I put that pressure that it's like not just going to be another group of people in an apartment looking at you know the, right. the alien invasion, which was like right. part of the pressure that I got for beyond skyline it was like just re you know do the same formula you know but make it better and put it in like china and i was like no 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 no. (laughs) like it it, each one has to kind of be its own adventure um and work Mm -hmm. as its own standalone story and uh we kind of get to make you know like a a different genre each time and kind of backdoor originality through a franchise if that makes sense right Mm -hmm. right no, and I think that's the thing. I, what I'm saying is that's the fallacy is they see it as too big of a risk when really people want this and people want new ideas and new adventures. And so, you know, maybe independent is where that's going to be happening a lot more, you know, kind of taking your lead on that. So, uh, but yeah, commendations. I don't know. Well, Lee, like okay. I say, you guys, this did not feel like an independent film. This felt like a major studio film. It's huge. It's big. It's so much action. And um. You guys were able to – you talk about a, a tenth of the budget. That budget really stretched, and we can see it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, it was – it's like each movie is – each movie is a is a reaction to the incredible, immense learning experience of the one before it, right? So, like, each time you do one of these things, it's like going to college in a way. You're like – you learn so many things, and you're like, oh, my God, I could do that better. I could do that more efficient the next time. Uh, and that kind of goes into how you even approach the script um, to then planning how to film it. You know, like the second movie, I wanted to use, I wanted to build one big tunnel set that was going to be my subway tunnel. It was going to be my ship tunnel and it was going to be the bunker tunnel for the third act. And that was my genius idea that like no one would listen to. And they didn't want to, didn't want to try it. I couldn't convince them. And then the movie budget wise it ended up costing, I think more than if they had just built like one amazing set and done what I said. The third one that people did listen and we just built this amazing cobalt set and we kept kind of using a lot of smart practical ways to reshuffle the deck uh, almost every single day. So every day that Johnny and the team would come in, it would be kind of all rearranged to a totally new version of the planet. 
uh, even to the point where we built the alien, I mean, uh, the, the, the human spaceship, you know, the converted mothership. And then once we were done filming that, we redressed that with alien, uh, you know, webbing and, you know, all the all our kind of like uh, liquid latex tricks to use that again to make another set out of it. So it's just constantly reusing things and being more efficient. Yeah. Now, a big part of sci-fi is the weapons. You know, you got Star Wars with the blasters and the lightsabers and all that. Now, that was such a big component you had to bring to the film. Can you tell us a little bit about the weapons and Jonathan, what it was like working with the weapons of the film? I mean, like day one when I got loaded up and I was like, this is my sci-fi little nerd dream. Like I had the most weapons out of every character in the movie. I think when I got off the ship and we stepped on Cobalt, you know, I had two of these hybrid pistols. I had a hybrid uh, AK-47 uh, rifle that I haven't seen in that picture there. Uh, I, had, um, I had these two swords that are like hybrid kind of Star Wars Jedi swords and a flamethrower. I was like, this is amazing. And then after, after like three days of shooting in it, I, the game was like, how can I get rid of these heavy weapons? So I <laughs> carry them in every scene. Um, well, no, like absolutely, it was, it was, that was a dream for me. You know, I think Daniel Bernard, I think he was a little bit, a little bit jealous and his insecure, his <laughs> inferiority complex that my weapon was bigger than his. You know, but, um, um, no, that was that was, you know, that was really funny. You know, it's just a credit to, to a credit to Liam. Like we were talking about the budget before, like it's just a credit to Liam that um, you don't notice the difference in this quality, right? In, in this production, like this this budget, like that's a massive credit to Liam and how we managed to make this film. Uh, you know, I remember doing, I remember shooting Thor, and there was a scene, and there was um, we were running away, and like an explosion, and like a kiss cat Dennings. And then one of the producers in post was just like, yeah, you know, we wanted to put a, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't exciting enough. So we, we put a monster in there, $5 million, to put, $5 million to put a monster in for like five seconds, you know? And, uh, and then, and the advantage of doing, of making this indie sci-fi movie is that you don't have green screen as much. Liam really wanted to work against doing green screen and use stuntmen as much as they can. And yeah, yeah. Right. And then, and, and the payoff of that is, you know, a few people that have watched the movie and the interviews I've done, they commented on like the chemistry and the relationship between me and Trent, uh, Rose's um, pilot brother who's got the alien body, but the, the consciousness of a human. Now that was something I didn't even think about. And that only came out because Jeremy Fitzgerald, the stunt guy playing, uh, playing Trent, the, uh, the pilot, is because we were living, living in the same hotel for three months. And so when we were on set, I actually had someone to like to play off. I didn't have like a really bored, nonplussed first AD. Okay, and now the monster picks up the human being. Oh, he's eating the human being. That's scary, you know, like, <laughs> That's we scary. didn't have those problems because we actually had, you know, uh, stuntmen in stilts, nine foot high with this amazing, amazing costume to play off. And Trent, Trent is, Jeremy is kind of Trent. Like he is like a bro who's like grumpy, <laughs> yeah, like just like wants to be drinking beer. And like, yeah. you know, fuck off. So like <laughs> that, was, that, was yeah. awesome that we ended up like, you know, having it, it's all kind of there in, in the performance. He's, he's kind of like the surly, uh, you know, tank who's, uh, who's going along on the, on the adventure. But yeah, the, 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 the green screen was going back to that beyond skyline and the lessons was like, because we didn't do this one big set build, I ended up having to shoot like, this massive set piece in in uh, on the alien ship green screen, and it was in a green tube with a with a techno crane without any previs, and so that like uh, made me grow like these extra neurons in my head of how hard it was, um, but and especially like doing an emotional scene where Frank Grillo's son gets his brain ripped out right in front of them, and it's just in a green tube. It was really really difficult. So I never never wanted to do it again. We only had two fully green screen sets in this. And it was mainly when Lindsay's on the catwalk uh, with the core drive. And there was a deleted scene where Leon took uh, Lindsay to go look at the core drive on the mothership, which we ended up not ne needing. But even those two days when we just did those green screen days, like everyone was so much less focused. I remember like everyone was just bullshitting on that deleted scene and like adding in jokes the whole time because your brain is like, searching for the reality of it yeah. um so yeah it was it was it was uh, kind of a, a philosophy on this movie that we would as much as possible at least have like three walls of the set so that 
the green screen would be on the other side. So we could film most of the action, um, most of the, the drama and have everything be in camera and not worry about it being a visual effects shot. But then like when uh, Daniel and Leon's fight, you know, it's going to look more epic if we, we, we put the dolly on the other side and we have the CG ship, you know, behind them kind of framing that battle as they go back and forth. So it, it, that was kind of all the, all the lessons from part two being uh, used in three. So, Liam, let me ask you a question about the the, the, the trilogy in general. Um, we <laughs> this, maybe some people aren't as familiar with you know the legacy of this film. Most people, came. yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, can we talk about like where it came from? For example, Luke and, and and you were talking before we started taping about like the first time he heard about it was his very first. Where, where was it, Luke? Well, I was just saying I, I saw that this was on Comic-Con. I unfortunately yeah. hadn't been to Comic-Con at, by 2010. I didn't go till 2012 or 13, but I saw but you guys had a panel on Comic-Con. I just wanted to hear about us being kind of a Comic-Con kind of base type show or kind of into all that culture. Just want to know like what your experience with Comic-Con was like and having like a gigantic Hall H panel there. Yeah. Even it, it, I go back to the year before it was 2009. Um, Greg and Colin, who directed the first one, like they signed with CAA that year and they were like, we have a Comic-Con party. You guys should just go down there and absorb it. And uh, it was great. It was great advice. We went down and we just went to some of the panels and like walked around. I I found a Dune T-shirt that I wore out uh, and I just had like this weekend of of just kind of absorbing it. And then flash forward the next year, having a panel there was like, wow. You know, it, it kind of that that happened quick. Um, so the panel to me was like, I mean, we filmed this movie for that that first movie for like, you know, forty days for under a million dollars to to shoot um, at at Greg's apartment building, and then like four months later, we're at Comic Con. It, it was it was like being on a rocket ship, really. And they, they uh, we had a great um, marketing guy from Relativity who passed away. His name was Jeff Amer, and he came up with all these really great gags where they had like foam people they had this machine that made foam people and then lifted them up into the air and that was in front of our massive billboard that said skyline so yeah that was kind of the whole peak of the uh of the first movie experience um and then yeah uh, i i would i would have loved to have gone to a comic-con for the the second movie but i think uh we had more money in like our twitter budget of marketing for the first movie than, than we had for all of the second movie. Let me just real quick follow up with that. And then um, I know Ben and Luke have a couple more questions as well, but like, let's talk about that first movie for a second. And I, yeah. in your director's statement, this is what you say. They made another Skyline movie. It's a legitimate, crazy question. I know it's even hard for me to believe we've made it this far in the 10 years since Skyline was released. Though the independent invasion thriller was an unlikely success story at the global box office, some of the critical reactions were so negative at the time, I was not sure that I would have a career a decade later, let alone a third entry in the franchise. You wrote that first film, and it got decent global box office, but uh, what was the reception audiences, or, crit- or critically, I guess I should say? And well, I, I think I, it's funny I said Twitter because that was like early early days of Twitter – but it was, I could just, I, I knew it was all bad from like, you know, we even had like the premiere on like a Tuesday and then the, rev- and it was great. Everyone had such an amazing time at that premiere. And then I think it was like Wednesday night, Thursday was the first review. And it was like scathing at a level that I was just not expecting because we had tested it and when you show it to investors and you kind of know when investors are happy, they don't ask you about a sequel. Right. Uh, and they don't they, they just kind of go, it's great. And they leave the room, you know. So uh, so it didn't it did kind of take us by surprise how much people did not respond. And when I was on Twitter and like refreshing it, there were people were just like worst movie ever, worst movie ever. And you're going to get that on every movie. But it was just like the percentages were not looking good. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask you real quick what changed between movie one and movie two? Because you were the writer, but not the director. Yeah. The, right. But then you directed the, the follow up seven years. Well, later. I, think it, I think it's a little alchemy all in all in all. Like, I think if the first movie was just released as a um, festival, like midnight movie, I think the reaction would be better without changing yeah. a single thing about it. But when you kind of put this massive marketing campaign behind it 
And like they even recorded lines from the actors that weren't in the movie being like, we have to fight back. That was literally never, ever a part of the movie. It wasn't an action movie. It was like a, a zombie movie, you know, where the characters uh, are, are sitting there listening to the radio like in Night of the Living Dead and they realize like they're fucked. That was the whole vibe. But because we had such amazing kind of sci-fi um, war imagery with like this, the, the airplanes and the nukes and all that, it just was like this, a genre match that people weren't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't delivering on what the expectations were, which was that, you know, the heroes were going to figure out some sort of weakness and, and kick alien ass. So mm -hmm. part of that was the reaction for part two to be like, okay, I think this alien menace that we've, uh, in, in the way that these the, the, these visuals work lends itself more to an action movie than an existential horror movie. So let's like, if we're going to do it, let's go, you know, kitchen sink, full on action movie. And so I really just sort of embrace like, uh, what if what if you were, you know, on a subway with like John McClane and uh, we did like Die Hard, uh, you know, in an alien invasion. And so that was really the kicking off for beyond skyline and then lightning kind of struck from the movie gods when we were over um scouting in in indonesia and it, it became presented to me that eco and yayan might be available and I, uh, you know i jumped on that and did everything i could to get them in the movie and then they were like well do you want us to do choreo i was like absolutely so then it just kept evolving into this crazy genre mash where we you know had a bunch of martial arts and the action just kept getting bigger and better cool so I have a question for Jonathan. Jonathan, you're coming into the third movie of a trilogy, okay? And and Lindsay has been in the second one and the third one, correct? Uh, I'm correct, right? Yeah. Now I had the opportunity. I probably like seven years ago or something. I worked with Lindsay in a um, a, a kids in schools program called The Big Show, where they mentor kids and the kids write little scripts and then they bring in actors and improvisers to perform them in front of the school at an assembly. And I met her, and I'm sure she wouldn't remember me, but I I believe she, she doesn't remember she, me. Don't worry. <laughs> she's, a, she's a pretty big sci-fi fan, I think, going back pretty far. I think she's like a Star Wars fan, if I'm not mistaken. Jonathan, coming into this, were you a sci-fi fan? Did you know about the rest of the franchise, or was this something that you were like, oh, I better watch these movies before I come in? <laughs> uh, I mean, a little bit of both. Um, like, I'd, I'd, I'd heard of Beyond Skylines. Um, I'd, uh, I'd, you know, I'd seen it advertised on Netflix. Um, am I a sci-fi fan? Yeah. I, you know, I love escapism, and I love fantasy, and, um, you know, that's kind of my go-to film of choice, you know, is to just to uh, – imagine what life could be like or you know in another world um so yeah i was i was a fan and uh, i was aware of lindsay's work and you know and then when i read the script and then then i went back and watched the movies and just to see how it had evolved from movie one and to where we we're going to go to with this one and then you know found out who the rest of the cast was and getting to have scenes with james cosmo and alexander Siddig, i was like yes please i think i think i want to be a part of this mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a blast. Now, for I, either of you, was there ever any like funny moments? I'm sure there's plenty of funny moments, but any particular moments that stuck out as just funny, cool things that happen? Yeah, there's there's actually a fun deleted scene, um, which I I think will be on the Blu-ray, um, which is still pretty rangy on the Blu-ray, but because it was just like you just knew it wasn't going to be in the movie. But uh, I let Jonathan just go nuts, which was like uh, the, kind of waiting for Godot, an alien planet. Um, once, once Trent and 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 Lindsay, uh, once Trent and Rose get separated from Owens and Daniel, uh, o Owens and uh, and Leon, they're kind of taken out of the narrative, and they kind of like watch them jump over the edge. And we just had Leon, uh, like you know, Johnny and Daniel just like improvised this whole scene where he was like. Oh, he caught, caught, caught you off guard, did he? So what's the plan now, boss? And he's like, uh, we'll figure it out. And you're like, uh, okay, in that case, I'm going to go have a piss. And he goes and <laughs> takes a piss behind the pillar on an alien ship. And like, even my first AD went up to me, Elliot, who was like, are you sure you want him to just like take a piss in this movie? <laughs> for sure this is a good idea. I was like, oh, it's probably not going to make it into the movie. <laughs> but of course, in the movie, we just kind of cut back to them and we just have Johnny like taking a piss without anyone commenting on it. And I just kind of like it because it's a, it's a weird little like off thing that you wouldn't do 
in a in a normal movie. But like, yeah, I mean, they've got nothing else to do. I would probably go take a pee right there. That that. That's yeah. like, like, uh, in, in these end of the world epic sci-fi movies, when do you ever see someone just go into the bathroom? You know, like eating a bit of food. You know, you don't see them doing these things. And it was like it was like a bunch of. Um, um, you know, little two eighths of a page, and we were going to try and just film them. You know, because it's an indie movie, we don't have a lot of time. We were just going to try and put them all together, and um, and he was like, rather than just stopping and then starting again, I was like, well, what would actually happen in this in between time? And then we had the, you know, and he was like, well, just keep playing it. And so like Daniel would be stood there. I'd be like, I'm going for a piss. And Daniel would be waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll be going, boss. He's like, be showing up. They're like, no, all right, won't be long. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> I think that um was it the first season of Mandalorian last year was the very first time they ever mentioned using the bathroom in the Star Wars universe. I oh, know that was this season. Oh, he this said season. if you need to use the privy, I think he called yeah. it. If you yeah, need yeah. to use the privy. And I was like, that's the first time they've ever mentioned the bathroom in Star Wars. All right. <laughs> I we are kind of coming to um, close to the end of our, our time together, guys. Hey, Luke or Ben, do you guys have anything left to, to ask these guys about, about the film? Where can people see it? You can see it on uh, VOD. So that means like iTunes, Amazon, um, you're on demand. If you have direct TV, all those uh, pay-per-view type portals, uh, December 18th. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it will be in some select theaters and drive-ins, but I have no idea what that means because the uh, lockdown quarantine stuff keeps uh, getting worse every day. So I would recommend, uh, you know, uh, watching it at home or at a drive-in. Cool. If, if possible. And Liam, and, and my final question is, um, you are, are you, you were the writer on the first one. Were you hired in or was this your baby? Because it seems like you seem to be the carrier of the flame of the franchise right now. How did that happen from you being the writer to now it is kind of your thing? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I came up with the with the the germ, I'd say, of the idea. Okay. I remember, you know, texting Greg what the idea was. And he was like, let's go get lunch. And uh, and then we we kind of hatched a plan. It was like a Monday morning, which is why the, the, the movie company name for one was Black Monday. And then, uh, yeah, I went to Joshua Cordes was a he was a previs artist at Hydraulics that I had worked on with uh, on AVP2 in their trailer. And so I was like he, he had he had a real strong horror background. And so I was like let's both work on this movie together. I'm, I'm going to work on like a three page treatment. You work on a three page treatment and then let's see what, where they line up. And we had a bunch of similarities and we kind of meshed them together and would pass the script back and forth. Um, but then with, and we worked on the, the treatment for part two uh, together, but then when it came time to writing it and when I, I knew I was going to direct it, I was like, I, I just kind of want to, I'm going to just write this for my myself because you know, uh, I can't be precious with anything. I, I and and as Johnny will tell you, I'm I'm not very precious with my own words. I'm I'm constantly, you know, looking for inspiration and and trying to always make it uh, better in in any way possible. Which is why it was always great to have him on set because I'm not the best at comedy and uh, having someone with that that comedic background, he could kind of always pick his spots and add levity where we needed it. Yeah, and I I got I got two things I want to thank you for one. Thank you for bringing Rona back to. Uh, <laughs> I love her. She is amazing. Look, Look at that. that woman. We love Rona. Yeah. Well, we all should have a moment of silence for Rona. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, 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 on, the, on the big screen is amazing. And number two, thank you for having like practical aliens that you get to punch and and, and it feels real. Like I am. Welcome to Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jo- Jonathan actually has like a therapy session with the uh, with Trent at the end, and uh, of course, the only breakthrough is just giving him a stiff elbow to the head. <laughs> I love that. Good. Hey guys, thank you so much for coming. I, I do have one final question. Um, so, is there any talks of a fourth film? And if so, do you have any type of dream casting? Like, if you could pull any kind of like actor or actors into this universe, like what would be that dream casting? There, there's, uh, there's, there's talk of a fourth film, um, you know, but it's uh, without getting too committal. Um, I'm working on, uh, on, on what that would be. Um, it's interesting. I, 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 I do love that we brought in the the British flavor on this one, 
Um, yeah. And uh, I, the, the one actress I've been thinking about is uh, you know uh, Gwendolyn Christie from uh, from Game of Thrones. Yeah, I feel like she would she could walk onto a, a skyline set and fit right away. But that that's kind of the the initial uh, germ of of my ideas for part four. Oh, let's make it happen. Let's make it. You heard it here. <laughs> hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today for the Kind Guy podcast. Um, Liam, where can people maybe find out more information or follow you about your upcoming projects? Uh, Liam Odin on Twitter and, and Instagram uh, update. Uh, we've, I've been doing a ton of be, uh, behind the scenes photos on the Instagram, like nice. uh, almost every day because we uh, just have so many. And uh, it was such a such a good uh, movie to shoot and, and such a great group of people. Uh, I love kind of sharing those. That's cool. All right, Jonathan, where can people find out about what you're working on? Yeah, I suppose on the old uh, the old Instagram, something that I've been, <laughs> been resisting for so many years. I remember on Thor, Natalie Portman being like, yeah, I don't do that. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do it either. And, uh, <laughs> seven years later, I'm like, damn, I missed that boat, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I think she's got like 10 million followers, so maybe she was like. Yeah, she's finally come around to it. Just you sabotaged Portman. your career. Let's, yeah, let's yeah. get it out there. No, she's thanks, for having, us. thanks for having us. You guys have been awesome. And uh, good luck to you guys on your on all your writing and acting and producing endeavors as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. Cheese man. And yeah, you can follow me here at uh, Cheese on Couch on both Twitter and on Instagram. And also check us out on theconguy.com. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, so I can all right. Oh, Jonathan's taking a picture of the screen. I love it. We're just <laughs> going on, on Instagram, everybody. Mr. Jonathan Howard on Instagram. No. For the gram. <laughs> Uh, all right, everybody. My name is Ben Cleaver. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at B-E-N-K-L-I-E-W-E-R. Cleaver, it's easy to say, hard to spell. Remember, everybody, uh, I'm always drinking out of this red cup because whenever Ben Cleaver shows up, it's always a party. <laughs> all right. Try to keep okay. up. Go out and see the film. It comes out December 18th. See it safely. See it video on demand or in select theaters, wherever it is showing. Liam, Jonathan, thank you for joining us today. Guys, please follow us here on The Con Guide. Leave comments. Give us good comments uh, so that we can keep on going. All right, guys. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye.